Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Yamaha AX-596 audio amplifier. Now this unit came into the workshop with a particular fault which I'll go into in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment but first of all let's just take a look at general specifications. First off what I will tell you is that this amplifier is extremely well built. When you look at the construction and the metal casing etc it is indeed uh, well constructed but also it comes in at about 10.6 kilograms so even when this thing is boxed you know you're sort of up to about 13 kilogram ship weight so an amplifier really which there's no real compromise as such in terms of build quality and also in performance as well so the amplifier is powerful so it will provide power output of rms of 100 watts into uh, eight ohms and that's per channel and what you can do is you can select between speaker set A and B or you can have both sets of speakers connected or off so maybe you're using the headphone jack and what you see from this amplifier the picture sort of shows it a little bit but you have this drop down flap and when you drop that down what you will have are your tone controls so you'll see your balance treble and bass and then you also have a loudness operation as well that's the one which is just on the right hand side before the channel selector and that will go from a flat response all the way to uh, minus 30 db and then frequency response is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and total harmonic distortion comes in at 0.015 percent and because the amplifier can accept directly a moving magnet type cartridge via a turntable your input uh, millivolts is 2.5 and that's standard and then for all of your other line inputs you have 150 millivolts and then in terms of inputs you have a phono connection as we mentioned a moment ago for the turntable you can connect your cd uh, tuner dvd tape md and then aux now what the amplifier has and you often see this on these sort of mid to high range type amplifiers it has the nice feature as well where you have a record output and what you can do is you can select which particular input you require and normally this would go out to um, some form of, of uh, recording device. You also have a preamp output as well but what's important to note is that you have these modes so you can go pure direct mode or like CD uh, DVD direct mode. Now what happens when you do that is two things. First of all, the tone control circuits become non-operational because what they're referring to is the purest of sound. So it doesn't go via the tone control. But what you'll also notice as well is that your preamplifier output, and when you look to the rear, and I'll show this in the video a little bit later on, you'll see that these are the metal links. And very, very common on most amplifiers of this type of series where you have a preamp output and then it would then connect to the main input. So you could take that preamp output and take it to another amplifier or maybe you bring in another pre-amplified output from another amp and then connect it then to the main so maybe you want to use the AX596 as just or maybe you've got a couple of these and you want to just use them as twin large power output amplifiers then um, but when you do that just be aware also as well that if you're selecting this direct mode in either combination what will happen is that preamp output is no longer functional and then in terms of dimensions, you're looking at height wise 151 millimeters by 435 by 396. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it is an extremely heavy amplifier, um, but that's not always a bad thing. Remember, you know, it just sort of relates also to the build construction. What you find inside the amplifier is a traditional EI type transformer. So it's not supporting a switch mode type power supply or a conventional toroidal. Now what I'm showing next is the rear of the amplifier and what I do like are these extremely robust speaker terminals and you can see them there so you know sort of testing of those that speaker set A you know no issue with making your connections there and then as you can see indicated it's showing you also B and then you also have this switch which is just below or, or slightly to the left of the 
auxiliary power socket where you can connect other devices to it from a power point of view. And this is your impedance depending on what type of speaker combination you want to connect to it. What the user manual will advise you to do is just to ensure that you depower the amplifier before you move that switch across. And then you can also see the what they term as the coupler. So this is where you have the preamp output and then the main connected. <clears throat> then typically then your phono connection with your ground just above there and then your CD and then all of your other inputs as well then. So what was the issue with the amplifier? Well, the customer uh, provided a bit of information. So it sort of gave you, you know, a little bit of insight. So what the customer advised was that intermittently the amplifier would lose audio on one of the channels or both channels. And there was a little bit of investigation that was done. And of course, maybe via, you know, forum websites or whatever, the customer uh, understood that it was probably related to the speaker protection relays, which in, indeed that fault often is linked to. Um, but I think through some investigation, the amplifier kind of just went off and then there was no audio at all. But what was interesting is that the customer advised that the LED on the front of the amplifier, so if you selected from, and you've got two switches, so let's just make a point of this. So you have the main power on switch, which is a latching type switch, and then you also have the standby switch. So when you operate that, of course, the amplifier would normally come out of standby mode, and because it supports a remote control, that would also switch it out of standby mode. So it appeared to come out of standby mode. So the LED on the front for the respective input illuminated. But what you didn't hear was any click. And really, you should hear two clicks dependent. So what I mean is that you would normally hear after a few seconds, providing no errors were detected, that the relay, which is on the startup board, would energize and provide power then to the main power transformer. And then after a small delay, no detection of errors, if you select the speaker set A or B, you should hear one of the speaker set or both speaker set relays change over. But that was not the case. So a little bit strange there. So once the investigation was underway, there was a number of things, you know, which sort of had to be checked. So when you look at the service manual, I'm sort of showing that next uh, within the, the, the picture overview. What I'm providing here is just an extract from the service manual, and I've referred to it as the startup power supply. Now, remember, this is only an extract. You know, if you look in the service manual, there's a lot more associated with the main power supply. But for the description of this fault, it's important that you only require this amount of information. And also as well, the circuit in this amplifier, although this was the service manual, some of the components shown here were not fitted on the board. And I'll mention that in a second. So basically what happens is that you have the power input which comes into the amplifier. You have the normal fuse protection that you will see. And there was no issue, of course, with the fuse, because as we said, we had an LED illuminating. But you can also see as well where you have these additional power connectors where you can come in and also the fuse. So once the mains power switch is pressed and that provides permanently a feed which then goes out to the main microcontroller. So it should receive a nominal 4.6 volts, about 4.8 volts after it's been regulated and rectified, etc. And that's constant. But when you press the standby button, either from the front or from the remote, what should happen is that the microcontroller then will send back the high signal and what happens is it appears on the pin here, which is called POD, POW for power. So because that voltage was then checked, quickly what you could determine was that the voltage wasn't present. But it was slightly misleading in terms of fault finding, because as soon as you connected the multimeter leads across there, what you would hear just for about a second is that the relay that's shown here, which is the startup power relay, would just click on and off just momentarily. So you kind of thought, well, hmm, maybe there's a dry joint or a, or a bad connection here. Um, so that board was, was removed and then uh, some checks were sort of made around that board, but everything was all good. Um, but at the same time, also took the opportunity then just to remove the top cover of the startup relay, just to ensure that the contacts were clean and there was no pitting or oxidization. So a little bit of oxidization. So that was cleared off, uh, but no pitting or anything like that. And then the relay reinstalled. 
Now, with regard to the components, there's only actually Q119 and the smoothing capacitor and the rectifier diodes that are on that board. And, of course, the back EMF diode, which is connected across the relay coil. The additional uh, series regulator type transistors shown on this schematic were not present. All right. So some are, some are not then. So once the board was reinstalled, there was no issues with dry joints or any sort of bad connection. The next thing to do then was to actually investigate, you know, what was causing this fault? You know, why did it appear that the actual control signal which should have been sent from the microprocessor was not reaching the startup board. So the next thing that I'm showing you here is the uh, microcontroller circuit and it's very easy to get access to the microcontroller. So when you look from the top of the board where you have the um, CD direct mode, it's the board on top of there and I also show it in the video as well. And it's very easy then to get access. So just use your multimeter negatively, connect it say to one of the negative speaker terminals. And then what you're able to do then is to check the status output. So what I'm looking for here is on the microcontroller, pin 16 should turn high when I press the button to take the amplifier out of standby mode. And as soon as that happened, straight away you could see the signal status was changing so that told you that there was no issue with the microcontroller there wasn't any errors coming in or the microcontroller was not for example in reset mode all was good so the, a little bit strange so you think okay what's kind of going on here and then when you look from the top of the board you know there's no sort of physical damage that you're aware of or anything like that so what had to be done then was really, you know, the complete strip down to get access to the main board. And I'm sort of showing you um, the amplifier mounted vertically. And um, what you have is the bottom cover plate and you can then remove it. So that gives you some degree of access, but not the level of access that you require to try and investigate this fault. Because really what you're at now is that you know that the microcontroller is generating the startup voltage. But what you realize is that it's not actually reaching the startup board. So there must be a breaking connection somewhere. You know, this isn't a sophisticated circuit. It's just a control signal going through. So what was required once the amplifier was sort of stripped down? Of course, I was also looking later as well to replace the speaker selection relays as part of the repair and service. But... It took a little bit of time to find this and I've sort of highlighted it in the video and what you can see then is that the circuit board for the main power amplifier and you can just see where you can see the speaker terminals, speaker set terminal B, there's a crack on the board and this crack on the board actually cuts through five um, circuit tracks and of course some of those circuit tracks are connected directly then with the three pin connector which is on the startup board and then that was the issue and you couldn't see it really so in terms of repair work what you then had to do and remember these tracks are very very close together what you have to do is you have to scrape off the coating which is on there just to expo expose the bare copper track and then you can then use link wire just to uh, bridge that gap and I've said this on many tutorials before what you don't want to do is just flow some solder across the cracked uh, track. It's not going to provide the correct mechanical strength and provide any longevity. So link wire was then used just to bridge those gaps then. And then because the amplifier you know, was stripped down, I took the opportunity then to replace the two speaker protection relays, which was the original issue as I mentioned earlier. And there's also one smaller control relay, which is linked like to the CD direct mode for, for bypassing the tone control circuits. And it's a similar design to the power star relay. So it's quite thin in design. Um, so I desoldered that, but it became apparent that at some point in time, someone must have took the uh, plastic case off because it was slightly split. And maybe, you know, during some investigation, some work was done. So checked as per the startup relay just to ensure that it wasn't pitted which it was not and then remove the small amount of oxidization and then reinstall that relay back in at the same time the main board was also checked for any visual signs for example of dry solder joints and also the capacitors were checked then with an ESR meter and no issues found at all now 
what I'm also showing uh, in the video as well is these very, very large toroidal transfer, sorry, these very, very large electrolytic capacitors, which are for the main power supply. And what you can see here, it, it clearly states on there for audio, you know, so they're making a prominent statement. And these are 12,000 microfarad capacitors at 63 volts. And it's stating here, uh, made in Japan. So straight away, you realize, you know, this is a, a good quality uh, build amp. They've not gone for low cost capacitors. And all the capacitors, the smaller electrolytic ones, are all by Elner anyway, ELNA. Um, so it tells you that's, that's good quality caps that are in there. And, you know, when these capacitors were being checked on the ESR meter, I'll tell you, they were so close within the specified tolerance, you know, they were like new capacitors, you know, really, really good. And I've seen these types of capacitors installed in many amplifiers and they give extremely good performance and also very, very good longevity in terms of operation as well. Now, the next thing uh, really what I want to draw your attention to is this sort of remedial work that you have to carry out on these amplifiers and it could be any amp. And this is where you have this mechanical stress. And again, I've mentioned this previously in other audio blogs. What you will find is that the RCA connectors, and I show you this, you start to see some cracks appearing around the solder joints. And the one which really drew my attention was the ones where you had the preamp input and the main output. So these are where the links connect. You could clearly see that the pad was broken away and you had this growing grainy. So next thing to do was then to just to resolder all of those connections on all of the RC input sockets just to make sure that you have a very very good mechanical connection to the relevant terminals and once that was done you know you were in a position then where you could then start to reassemble the amplifier with regard to the input selection this amplifier does not use high quality electromechanical relays it's kind of maybe in terms of time and era where you have um, analog input switching which are done by dedicated Toshiba analog input switching ICs and the reason why I mention that that if you do the input selection some amplifiers sometimes you hear like a click noise as the input selection relay for each input just de-energized and the next one then energizes here you don't hear that so when you uh, select the input channel from the front slide you know less than a second where you won't hear any audio and then it will then select the next track or the next input then um and that's kind of it so i think really you know from a repair point of view uh, an enjoyable repair and um, for sure uh, from the customer's point of view you know they, they should be seeing you know many many years of operation with regard to the performance of the amplifier and uh, it's sometimes nice you know to sort of work on some of these more powerful higher end uh, audio amplifiers it's almost a little bit like a balance between what you would tend to find in large power amplifiers and then domestic audio amplifiers as well then so as i said that sort of brings us to a close now so i appreciate you stopping by and again if you have any questions or you need any further information by all means come back to me and i'll be more than happy to uh, to give you any advice and just email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com so until the next time all the best cheers and bye bye